event last night at Blumhouse Pictures, producer Jason Blumhouse announced legendary Master of Horror director J John Carpenter will executive produce a new movie in the Halloween series. Miramax and Blumhouse Productions are co-financing production of the project, with longtime series producer Malika Cod overseeing the project under his Trancus International Films banner. The new movie will be the first Halloween film since 2009's Halloween 2, director Rob Zombie's sequel to his 2007 remake. In a statement about the movie, John Carpenter said, We're probably going to go back to the original traditions that we started with early on. It's kind of gone astray a little bit. I thought maybe the remake went off somewhere that I didn't want him to go. Michael Myers is not a character. He is a force of nature. He is not a person. He is, a, he is part supernatural, part human. He's like the wind. He's an evil wind. When you start straying away from that and you get into explaining, you're lost. So hopefully we can guide it back in that direction. Just before we started the show today, a brand new trailer for the upcoming Halloween movie dropped. <laughs> no. <Whoa>. God damn shit! <laughs> oh shit! <sighs> wow. Okay. All right, so after this, I'm gonna watch it, I don't know, five more times because that was great. That was great. God, that was me. I need a cigarette. I've already came four <laughs> times. All right, pretty damn good trailer. So, all right, initial thoughts. That final scene was badass. That's a definitely a, a classic kind of John Carpenter style. Uh, but our thoughts on David Gordon Green's Halloween. Yeah, we're gonna ruin everything. Um, just kind of like how they did this movie. No, I'm kidding. It's not that bad. <laughs> but I guess if you just want to hop right into it, uh, this movie, for at least for me, was mildly disappointing. Yes. Uh, I've doing this podcast. We've talked about this. I've been completely hesitant and skeptical of this film to begin with. So I mean, it's disappointing, but it's kind of what I expected. I guess you know, I wasn't totally surprised by the outcome because I was preparing myself for this. And it's a... My thoughts of... It's not going to be as bad as a lot of the stuff in the franchise. It, that's totally yeah. true because mm -hmm. this is an actually well-constructed film, you know? Mm -hmm. um, they took care of it in that sense. So I would say when we came out of there, you, you asked, me, asked me my thoughts, and I was saying, well, they're lucky that they have things like Halloween 5 and resurrection and h2o to kind of fall back on because this will be this won't be considered the worst in the franchise yeah no it's it's definitely not. This video has been on my mind for a long time. I know that's a really cliche way to open a video essay, considering how many of them there are nowadays, but it is the truth. If you've been following our channel for a little while now, you probably have a good understanding of our, well, for lack of a better term, disappointment with the latest installments to the Halloween franchise. When word got out that Blumhouse was going to be making new films, and not only that, but that we were going to be wiping the slate clean, taking away all the previous installments, whether they were good, bad, or just in the middle. They were gone. All signals and signs pointed to this being a really exciting reinvigoration to the franchise. I mean, seriously, a shot in the brain. This only got better when word got out that John Carpenter, the Godfather himself, was even coming back to executive produce and score the film. And the Scream Queen herself, Jamie Lee Curtis, was coming back for one last, last go around with Michael. And as you can probably guess, the hype for this film was at an all-time high. Hell, even the cherry on top of all of this was that Nick Castle, the original Michael Myers himself, was coming back to play the shape in a few key scenes. This really seemed like our shot. So yes, my excitement and faith in this being the Halloween sequel that we've all been waiting for for the last 40 years was completely restored. 
But then the movie came out. The consensus seemed pretty mixed when general audiences got a chance to see this flick. A lot of people loved it, but a lot of fans of the franchise loved parts of it. But there were some parts that I myself and others couldn't wrap our heads around as to why they were including it in this film. Your partner, the greatest partner in the world, oh. made an arrangement with the Vietnamese folks at the restaurant mm. and had them make you your very own peanut butter and jelly banh mi sandwich. This really sucked because all parts were there. This really seemed like it would be the definitive Halloween sequel. Now, I know this film has its defenders, and if you love it, I'm in full support of you. I'm glad you got something more out of this film than I did. But I feel that it missed the mark. Why? <laughs> well, that's a video for another time. I'm here to discuss a different kind of Halloween film. One that we almost got. I'm talking about the Halloween script written by Ben Collins and Luke Petrowski. Of course, entitled Halloween. This was a script written back in 2012, just after the Rob Zombie films hit their end and the franchise was looking for a new path, so to say. These guys really took the time and care to not just bring us what, in my opinion, would have been a standout Halloween film, but a brilliant and fresh look at Michael Myers' character and the presentation as a whole. They truly understand the science of what makes Michael such a brutal and horrifying force of nature. In other words, what gives the shape his shape. Last October, an article was released on Bloody Disgusting by Jason Jenkins as a part of the Phantom Limbs collection. It's a brilliant series of deep dives into horror movies that almost were, and the creatives behind them. It's the base for my entire video, and I implore you to go read the write-up. It goes into even deeper detail about this script than even I'd be able to cover in this video. I left a link in the description for you to check it out once you're finished with this video. It's very insightful. Collins and Petrowski are a writing duo responsible for projects like The Night House, Super Dark Times, and Hulu's upcoming Hellraiser reboot. They were called upon by Dimension Films back in 2012 to write a screenplay for a new Halloween film. This was, as Colin puts it, the first true indicator that Rob Zombie would not be attached to whatever the next film would become. Firmly cementing this notion was that the people over at Dimension Films hadn't even given the writers any firm guidelines or parameters to follow. As Colin says, it was more of a, just tell us anything. This was exciting for the duo, who had been longtime fans of the Halloween movies and were eager to give their own spin on the material. The only problem was, they didn't have any ideas. They just knew that they had to get moving. Petrowski adds, We were coming out of the found footage boom, so we were pretty jazzed at the idea of a movie that wasn't going to be found footage. Keep in mind that Paranormal Activity was dominating the Halloween box office at the time, so the slasher genre had not been in the spotlight for a little while. Petrowski continues to say, We were coming out of the Rob Zombie Halloweens and all the history of Michael Myers and who he is and the brother-sister thing and all the mythology. So our position was, and this was the part that was going to piss fans off, but it was just like, let's get rid of all that shit. This is the exact approach that Blumhouse took when they announced their new Halloween trilogy. They used this as a major push to not only announce the film, but for all of their marketing. Wasn't it her brother who, like, cold-blooded murdered all those teenagers? No. That's just a bit that some people made up to make him feel better, I think. Petrowski would continue to say, You're watching the first movie, and you don't know why this guy is like this. He's not a sad little kid with a backstory. He's a machine. He's the shape. So, our thing was, we're not going to do another version of Laurie Strode. We're not going to do another version of Dr. Loomis. We're not even going to do another version of Michael Myers. Our treatment doesn't even call him Michael Myers. He's always referred to as The Shape. And there it is, folks. This is ultimately the make it or break it for this concept for most fans and audience members. I know for some this is ridiculous. Taking away all these key points that make the franchise what it is, including the name Michael Myers. But you see, that's the whole reason why I feel this idea is so brilliant. We have had sequel after sequel, reboot after reboot, to the point where now even the official reboot, reinvigoration of the franchise as you will, 
that cuts out all the previous stories <laughs> can't even tell a story with these characters without falling back into the same old song and dance they were doing before. But the Collins and Petrowski script is saying to hell with all of it. Let's strip the thing down to nothing more than the core element and go from there. And that element is the shape. Collins adds, in a way, we sat and thought about it. It was like, what is scary about Halloween? What is the concept of the movie that's scary? It's like, well, what if one day out of the year, there was a serial killer who just killed a bunch of fucking people in one town and then disappeared and was never caught? Like reapproaching the whole idea of why we should be scared of the day because of this rumor, this myth, this idea that there's a guy that's going to kill you on Halloween. He's gonna get you! Petrowski says, very much kind of rebranding the idea of the shape as an urban legend. Almost like a creepypasta, like the internet era kind of thing. It was rumor mill stuff, right? Because he's not a serial killer that's wanting to be caught. This would not only add weight to the character of the shape, but also really give meaning back to the title of Halloween. When I read this, I could feel the chill in the air through a quiet Midwestern town as the trick-or-treating festivities come to a close, the town begins to go quiet. Of course, you'd have the people that are just so in love with the season and caught up in all the fun of it, they wouldn't be paying any attention. But then there's people who would feel the chill. They would stop, look down the suburban streets, and think about all these stories they've read about this Halloween killer and think, is he here? Is he watching me? Collins goes on to say, because it's like if one town had an unsolved string of seven murders that occurred over the course of Halloween and they never caught anybody, and then another town on the other side of the country had the same thing a few years later, I don't know how many law enforcement officials would actually rush to declare that there's a national level uncatchable serial killer. That's the kind of hysteria they would avoid doing. So the idea that if it was occurring, it's something that you would hear about from people that read about it on the internet a decade ago. So this was what it would really be like if there was a serial killer that only killed on Halloween. Do you know that I pray every night that he would escape? What the hell do you do that for? So I can kill him. Well, that was a dumb thing to pray for. We have characters listening to a 911 call that was supposedly from this killer, and there was only ever one image of him. Petrowski says a blurry shot of the mask that looked almost abstract, that it was found on a phone of one of the victims. And the people on Reddit put together that, oh, here's the 911 call, here's this image. So the urban legend of The Shape is that every Halloween for the past seven years, there's been at least one horrific murder somewhere in the United States. People think that there's a connection, and it might all be the work of the same killer, who they've taken to calling the Boogeyman, or the Shape. So there's this online conspiracy community. Maybe he's not even human. There's a couple of homeless guys in Detroit who got killed. Was that him, or was that not him? The next year, there was a girl walking home alone from a party. That's where the photo came from. And there was this elderly couple in Maine. A whole family got killed in the Chicago suburbs the next year. Then the entire third floor of an apartment complex in South Carolina the previous year. Then the most recent year, one of those victims escaped and ran down the street and was caught. That was the cold open of the movie. But that's the existence this character had on the culture. Just this unstoppable force that would show up. And he shows up in our town for our characters to deal with. In essence, what Petrowski and Collins are doing is taking events of that first night and giving us ultimately what I feel Carpenter's true vision of Michael's future would have been had we not gotten any of the sequels. Evil who kills indiscriminately one night a year for nearly 30 plus years. The birth of the internet would lead people to spark their own theories and connect the dots on who this killer is. Some of these killings may not even be the work of the shape. But that's where the real horror lies in this pitch. It's not about if he was responsible for them or not. It's the fear that sticks with people. That's why it truly makes Michael transcend and give him an almost supernatural element without having to lay all the cards out on the table. Is he human or is he something else? 
it's important to give the audience a nugget to wrestle around with in their heads. Now to get into specifics, Collins and Petrowski do detail some of their ideas on how the story would be framed and our characters that would have been involved. The idea of making this follow-up take place 30 years after the events of the first film would see a stark contrast from the idyllic suburban setting of the late 70s, early 80s. We are, at the time of this script being written, only a few years after the collapse of the housing market, and most of those modern, idyllic suburbs were all abandoned graveyards now. Petrowski would best describe it as, So, I know we had a lot of conversations looking at who our characters are going to be and what the themes of this movie were going to be as well. In some ways, it's like, oh, here's the pristine white picket fence, and here's the maniac in the costume who's killing here. And I lived in a neighborhood that was cookie-cutter housing at the time. I wanted to buy my first house. I bought this cheap house, and the housing market fucking collapsed, and they didn't finish building the neighborhood. So half my neighborhood was just wood frame houses with plastic tarps up. There were a lot of people that didn't move in, so it's like five or six neighbors... There's skeletons of buildings and empty plots. It was like this weird ghost of suburbia. It's like Chernobyl. It's like a hundred houses. It can't be four people living here. No, fuck that! So we wanted our Michael Myers to feel like this drifter that could enter into these essentially ghost towns of middle America and was stalking them with a little bit more of a free reign. It was less of an infiltration into the ideal and more about failure, the failure of the suburban dream. The pair would go on to describe how this overarching narrative of failure would bleed into our characters as well. Our lead would be a lot like Charlize Theron's character from Young Adult. She would have been a downtrodden college dropout who was forced to come back home after not being able to make it in the real world. With her return home, she would also have to face failed relationships. They discussed specifically her reconnecting with an old boyfriend, having to try to make up for lost time with her sister, who felt that she ultimately abandoned her. The way it's described in the interview, it feels very much like the duo spent a great deal of time trying to make characters that we could connect to. She is in a really rough spot in her life, and is about to be flung into a night of pure, life-altering terror. This brings us back to the shape. The duo would go on to describe a few key scenes that detail his reign of terror this Halloween night. The way it starts is equal parts frightening and beautiful if you've been a longtime fan of this franchise. I feel it fully encapsulates the shape in a few silent frames. The scene is described as follows. We had a whole little bit where the first thing that the shape does when he rolls into town is go sit on a park bench where he's waiting for the clock to chime 7 or 8 at night basically waiting for the sun to go down. As soon as the sun goes down, he puts on his mask, and the first thing he does is goes to a local 911 dispatch office and kills everybody in there so that no one can call 911. The ability of people to communicate with each other and get help or figure out what's happening would be really hurt because at that point, according to the legend, one of the characters says he's gotten better. He's gotten more ambitious. So this time, he's just attacking the town. The imagery they describe here gives me major Halloween 2 vibes. The shape moves his way through a hospital, killing guards, nurses, and other hospital staff with ease. You could really recreate that kind of horror here in the police dispatch office. With us already establishing this town as run down and almost ghost-like, it's not much of a stretch to think that there wouldn't be as many cops in the town, let alone on duty. This would cripple the town, as no one would be able to reach out for help. Another impactful scene that was described by the duo was one in which our lead was home alone with her sister. One would be upstairs and the other would be watching TV. She'd be watching a horror movie where the person on TV is screaming in terror, but when she goes to switch the channel or switch it off, she would be shocked to hear that the screaming has not stopped. It's coming from her neighbor's house. She would make her way to the window where she would be horrified seeing a masked man breaking his way into the home. This kind of creativity and groundedness to the situation would be what primarily fills this film with terrors. It's what really sets this story back to the roots of the original Halloween for me. The original film affected people by showing us this could happen on any suburban street in any town. This script by the duo would have taken that original idea and based its whole lifeblood around it. 
I feel this is even further encapsulated in the ending of this film. They end up holed up in a Walmart. Our lead is all cut to shit trying to protect her sister, finally having to stand up and be the responsible one. They're trapped in some old freezer or something, and they're fucked. He's pounding on the door and he's trying everything he can to get to them. But then, the sun comes up, 8 o'clock rolls around, and Halloween night is over. And he just leaves. To some, I could see this as being a huge disappointment. I feel it works within the confines of this story, though. It creates the question of, is he truly driven by the kill? Or does this mean that there's something else entirely at play here? I think going forward with sequels, this would have been a really smart place to end it. This does, however, bring me to the only part of this pitch that I feel kind of crosses the line a little too much. When dealing with this character, there are fine lines that we do not want to cross. One of those lines is him speaking. For God in hell, die! I really like the idea that if we're going to show any part of his face, you'd only do it at the very, very end, Colin says. I like the idea that he would be at a Waffle House, basically, ordering breakfast, so if you got any line of dialogue, it might be, like, very, very short. Like, some sort of hello or acknowledgement of the waitress that brings him coffee. The waitress was like, oh, you work nights too, huh? Or something like that. Now, I give the guys some breathing room here because it's simply just a pitch. It's not like this was fully cemented and that this is how they were going to handle the shape going forward. But for me personally, I like the idea of him just simply walking away and disappearing as quickly as he arrived. Like Carpenter always viewed him, a force of nature, having him speak or even seeing his face clearly would not be the route I'd like him to go. In order for Michael to retain the moniker and essence of the shape, I feel like it's important to keep him at arm's length. Again, I have faith that they would have seen past this ending, and they even comment about it at the end of the article. And I've told this to people before that have wanted to crucify us. But to me, part of this would just be implying to the audience that you could see this guy out there and not know he's the shape. You know what I mean? Just the idea of putting him back into the world in the same way that the strangers did. I think really effectively, too. At the very end, the strangers are just fucking people who drive away in a pickup truck. They're not monsters anymore. And the idea of like, yep, now he's just going to go back into hibernation for another year and hopefully he doesn't come back to your town. The last part of this interview only scratches the surface of what the writers would be considering when it comes to a follow-up film. They talk about the advantages of truly wiping the slate clean and the freedom that it gives to creatives. They mention that this would leave the door open for sequels or prequels, all dealing with different Halloween nights and killings. Although there weren't any specifics given on how exactly these stories would play out, through all my research and writing this script, I have kind of developed my own take on where the story could go next. If you would indulge me, I'll keep it very simple and to the point. My story would pick up directly after the events of the first film. We would shift perspectives on our main characters, letting the two sisters go on with their lives, and instead follow a detective and a journalist who cross each other's paths while investigating these recent slayings. The journalist has been connecting dots for over two years on these killings and can't seem to figure out where the killer will strike next. All he knows is that it would be on Halloween night. For whatever reason, the killings of the last film were more brutal and the body count was higher than years past, leading to the journalist's suspicion that the killer is needing more to get him by year to year. In my movie, the detective and the journalist would then spend the next year going over clues. They'd be going back through the murders and where they took place, investigating all the details. They'd even be interviewing survivors, all ending with them finding their way back to Haddonfield, Illinois. There they would find the last puzzle piece, that being the story of Michael Myers, finally giving him his name. The story would feel very Fincher-like to me. I picture elements of Mindhunter and Zodiac with the dressing and tone of Halloween. I picture a great scene nearing the end of the second act, where they think they're moving in on the killer. They take a guy into custody only to find out he's just some sicko who's obsessed with the legend and idolizes the shape. It would be different for sure, but I feel that's the whole point of this. We want something fresh and new. There is room to sprinkle more of the old in as well. Maybe at one point the pair get to interview Laurie Strode in the events of 1978 as a quick cameo. 
The article would go on from this point to discuss why the script didn't go forward, and it seems to come down to just a general lack of interest from the studio. The duo swung for the fences, but were ultimately passed over. It's a bold concept that without a doubt would divide fans and cause a lot of discourse. I can understand why coming off of the Rob Zombie films, the studio may have wanted something that played it a little closer to the chest. I feel that you get that with Halloween 2018. They wanted to bring fans back to the theaters to see classic Michael again. And even though I and many others take issue with some of the choices they made, There is no denying that they succeeded. Halloween killed at the box office, and they immediately greenlit two more installments, the last of which is due to release this year. In conclusion, I do really love this franchise. Through all the good and the bad, I will always be excited when they announce a new Halloween film. But I feel sooner rather than later, we're going to need to let go of some of these tropes we've grown to expect. A concept like Collins and Petrowski's script could really give us some new ground to walk on. It could bring fear back to the franchise and give us the classic version of the shape the Carpenter set out to make all that way back in 1978. Well, there you have it, guys. The night he almost came home. The Halloween movie we never got. This video, man, I have been working on this thing since July. Uh, this really, really became a, a completely different animal than what I could ever anticipate. And I absolutely adore video essay formats. I, I think that there's some really creative ones out there. I mean, back in the day, I used to watch the ones that Chris Stuckman would put up about things like, you know, enemy and, uh, you know, only God forgives and stuff like that. And they, they would just blow my mind, just like the clip show, everything, just these little like tight compound documentaries. And I have been wanting to make one since I saw those videos. And this is my first. So I really appreciate you sticking through it, making it to this point and watching it. I hope that it was informative and you got something out of it. Um, you know, this was a story that I came across uh, earlier this summer and I just kind of knew when Luke and I were discussing the Splatterthon and that we wanted to do some kind of big videos for this month that I wanted to do a video essay. And this story seemed like the perfect one for me to do because I, I was so attached to their concept. I really enjoyed it. And like I said, it, you know, just even spawned me to think about uh, how they would continue that story or how that could story could spin off into other things. And you know, overall, I, I just really got lost in this world. Now, this was definitely not perfect. I mean, there's definitely some edits in there that I, I wish I had more time to work on. I figured a few months would give me plenty, but, uh, you know, here I am, and uh, we're post uh, the release of Halloween Ends. I was hoping to have this out before then, but uh, I just kept fine-tuning and tweaking a couple things. I just wanted this to be as good as I can get it, and I I mean, even though I was pulling my hair out, I enjoyed the process, and I think that I'll keep doing it. I already have kind of another idea in mind of what I'd like to do next, um, but hopefully you guys enjoyed it, and hopefully that you uh, you got, like I said, got something out of it, and that uh, you know, you'll know you share it around and let people uh, experience this story if they don't know about it. Um, some special thanks I want to give to, uh, especially to Jason Jenkins for not only writing the article and getting it out there for all of us to be able to read and get our hands on, but uh, I have a special video coming to you guys this Sunday. Uh, we did about an almost an hour long interview with him last month uh, for the post release of this video. And I'm super duper excited to uh, show that to you guys. He's a super cool guy. Uh, really gave us a, a fantastic interview uh, answered a lot of questions, not only about this script, but uh, Phantom Limbs in general. And again, please go check out his work on Bloody Disgusting. The dude is a fantastic writer and really just has a knack for like uncovering these hidden horror film gems as far as just like these stories that never were. And uh, I can't get enough of those articles. And I mean, this again was quite a feat for me. And I, I wouldn't be doing it without his work.
So thank you, Jason. I put all of this out there as basically my tribute to you and your work. So uh, I, I appreciate it. Um, other than that, guys, we are deep into the Splatterthon. Uh, we just posted our review for Halloween Ends yesterday, uh, and we are going to be having a discussion video coming to you guys hopefully on Saturday here where we're just going to kind of deep dive into that film. Uh, as well as some more Splatterthon content coming to you over the last couple weeks of October here. We got a lot more on the docket. Um, and other than that, we do have a giveaway that we're doing right now. I don't have the Black Phone Blu-ray, but we are giving away a copy of the Black Phone as well as a Splatterthon mug. So if you guys are interested and want to get involved with that, just click the link down below and we'll be selecting the winner on a live stream at the end of the month. Um, other than that, you can keep up with us on our social media at Splattercast Pod. And if you're new here and this is the first time you've kind of stumbled onto our channel and you think we deserve it, you feel like our content's good or you like this and you want to see more, hit subscribe because we're growing and it's awesome and everybody's just been really supportive and cool. And I absolutely adore this community. So thank you guys. Um, but I guess that's about going to wrap it up for me. So uh, till next time, guys, stay scared.